All right, extra space. Nope. Oh my God, there's another one. Oh no. <laughs> what was I thinking? Hello everybody and welcome back to a man who's trying to find the perfect summer dress. My name is Evan Ettinger and you've already seen the title. You know the thumbnail. I'm in this position. What are we up to? Today, I'm gonna be trying to finish an English language GCSE. Now, I did do a math one last year. You guys seem to really enjoy that. I do have a degree in math. I do not have a degree in English, but in America, you do have to have a couple English courses in order to get your bachelor's in anything. I did English 101, 102, right? So I should be able to complete a British high school or their equivalent secondary school test in English, correct? We shall see. Without further ado, I've got everything set up here. All right, no distractions. Also, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, so we'll be hearing more about that in the middle of the video. We're gonna try and edit this down as much as possible so that we can just get the goods. I have no clue what to expect here. I, I <laughs> have not, I don't know, I'm just not prepared. I feel like I'm giving myself so much anxiety going into this so I can prepare for the mental anguish. Right before I go into it, I should probably talk about what I'm expecting this to be. I'm expecting it to be very technical, so it's gonna give me like a story and then I have to be like, what is the gerund phrase in this? Or, I know it's not gonna be multiple choice because I don't think you guys have that in the UK, but I just, I'm not looking forward to the writing segment. So without further ado, I guess we should just get started. I'm not gonna start until I finish putting my center number, of course. My candidate number, center number, of course, was 420, candidate number 69, I'm bringing it back. Surname, we got Edinger, forename, Evan. Hope you're enjoying the rain. This rained last time, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a sign. You should not do tests in the rain. I've got an hour and 45 minutes and... <sighs> Let's go, all right. What do we got? Read again the first part of the source from lines one to nine, okay? List four things about this jungle. All right, so let's, I've got the source printed out somewhere back here. Oh gosh, already getting stressed out. Source A. Oh, just, oh my God. <laughs> cool, 23 seconds used really, really wisely. So we got source A right here. Using a time machine, an organization called Time Safari transports clients into the past to take part in hunting expeditions. A group includes Mr. Eccles, together with their guide, Travis, is visiting a prehistoric jungle in order to shoot a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And what we got here, it says, read the source from one to nine. I'm just gonna do that then. The jungle was high and the jungle was broad. Repetition. Sounds like music and flying tents filled the sky. Those were pterodactyls soaring with huge gray wings. I've hunted tiger, wild boar, buffalo, elephant, but now this is it, said Eccles. I'm shaking like a kid. Ah, uh, said Travis. Everyone stopped. Travis raised his hand. Ahead, he whispered. In the mist, there he is. There's his royal majesty now. The jungle was wide and full of twitterings, rustlings, murmurs, and sighs. All right, that's reading pages one, bleh, lines one to nine. List four things about the jungle from this part of the source. All right, so the jungle was high, the jungle was broad. So the jungle was large and tall. Sounds like music and flying tents filled the sky. There were a lot of sounds in the jungle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Re I've only got two things so far. I'm not gonna do well, am I? The jungle, I feel like this is pro, I'm, I don't know how I could be doing this wrong. The jungle was tall, the jungle was broad, so am I supposed to like reference it? The jungle was prehistoric, I know that from inferring, right? It was wide, he keeps repeating, the jungle was high, the jungle was broad, the jungle was wide. There's a lot of different sounds going on in here. Very overwhelmingly large, it was very vast, he says. Broad. I'm gonna put quotes in there. Uh, I honestly, I'm. I really hope I get points. I have no clue how this works. Full of twitterings, rustlings, murmurs, and sighs. So we pick up that it's ancient, right? The jungle is prehistoric. The jungle was wide and full of twitterings. In the mist, the jungle was misty. All right. So we're just gonna move on from that. Next up, it came. Wait. What? What does this say? Look in detail at this extract from lines 16 to 26 of the source. All right. So 16 to 26. Let me read the rest of this. Suddenly it all ceased as if someone had shut a door. Silence. A sound of thunder. Out of the mist 100 yards away came Tyrannosaurus Rex. It, whispered Eccles. It, uh, shh. It came on great oiled, there we go, resilient striding legs. It towered 30 feet above half of the trees. A great evil god folding its delicate watchmaker's claws close to its oily reptilian chest. Each lower leg was a piston. A thousand pounds of white bone sunk in thick ropes of muscle. We got so much going on here, literary wise. We've already lost ourselves. Sheathed over a gleam of pebbled skin like the armor of a terrible warrior. Uh, that's personification or something, right? Uh, at, each thigh was a ton of meat, 
ivory, and steel mesh. And from the great breathing cage of the upper body, those two delicate arms dangled out front, arms with hands which might pick up and examine men like toys, while the snake neck coiled, and the head itself, a ton of sculptured stone, lifted easily upon the sky, its mouth gaped, exposing a fence of teeth like daggers, its eyes rolled, ostrich eggs, empty of all expressions save hunger. It closed its mouth in a death grin. It ran, its pelvic bones crushing aside trees and bushes, its taloned feet clawing damp earth, leaving prints six inches deep wherever it settled its weight. All right, so how does the writer use language here to describe the Tyrannosaurus Rex? You can use words and phrases, language features and techniques, <laughs> sentence forms, water. Oh God. So here's where my memory of literary techniques comes in. So how does he describe the Tyrannosaurus Rex? Very tall, it towered. 30 feet above half the trees. How much writing space do I have? Oh, there's a lot. There's, there's a lot of space. Let's just start with the first one. The writer describes the T-Rex. I'm really, I'm not gonna get points off of that. <laughs> I'm so stressed. <laughs> uh, 8,000 pounds. Yeah, I, I understand what's going on, but I don't understand <laughs> what's going on. It towered 30 feet above half the trees. So the writer describes this as, I wanna say overwhelmingly, over, Overwhelmingly tall by saying it towered 30 feet above half the trees. So I should probably include what, what type of sentence form did he do here? And if there's any language features and techniques, it came on great oiled, resilient, striding legs. Those are, it's a list. He's using a list of, of, with commas to kind of be like, oh, here's some extra information. I'm gonna keep giving it to you. It towered 30 feet above half the trees, a great evil god. Describes here as overwhelmingly tall by saying it towered 30 feet above the trees and overpowerful by, uh, by comparing it to an evil god. He is, uh, if you say evil god, is that personification? It's not like the watchmaker, I, that, that's personification, right? His little watchmaker claws. The writer describes the T-Rex as overwhelmingly tall by saying it towered 30 feet above half the trees and by comparing it to an evil god, he is... He is using, <laughs> I don't know. Wow, I'm really bad at English. Should have listened to my English professor. Never do English again. To an evil god, he's creating a feeling of intimidation. That's a good word, right? For the reader. All right, so that's totally one. How does the writer use language here to describe it? Oh, it doesn't even say I have to do four things. That was the previous one. So I just have to keep going. Oh, okay, I, I was looking for four separate things. This makes me feel a little bit better. Each lower leg was a piston. Uh, 1,000 pounds of white bone, muscles sheathed in a gleam of pebbled ice skin. Oh, here we go. I was saying like the armor of a terrible war warrior. This description gets stronger when he personifies the T-Rex by comparing it to a, quote, terrible warrior. So the reader can envision the feeling of seeing the great beast better. Uh, let's see, we've got its mouth gaped, exposing a fence of teeth like daggers. He compares the teeth to daggers to show a comparison to weapons for killing. Wow, I don't know how we're gonna do here. He compares the teeth to daggers to show a comparison to weapons for killing using many similes throughout. Well, now we've gotta go on to here. Oh, oh, he says he might examine men like toys. These, these hands could examine men like toys. Further describing the T-Rex's giant size, the rain is really coming down now. He, what's the word? It's like, he, he uses person, no, it's not personification. Not everything is personification. <laughs> it's, it, is it just metaphor, simile? I honestly can't remember the difference. I thought one was as and one was like, and uh, it's been like too long for me to remember he this. He says, men in comparison are like toys, something, something toys, which is a simile. I'm really hoping that's a simile to allow the reader to feel how insignificant small Eccles feels in the presence. Spell presence right, Evan, Jesus, of the T-Rex. They also want sentence forms. So utilizing, oh, there's gonna be an S here because it's England. Uh, utilizing many comma separated lists, he builds the terrifying image of the beast with increasing intensity. Like when he says it came on great oiled striding legs. Or, oh God, no, 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 no. 
We're just gonna cross that all out because I just said I was using a he was using adjectives and I don't wanna have to rewrite all that. So we're actually just gonna pretend that didn't happen. Cross it out, hope to die, stick a needle in my thigh made of muscle. Let's see, close his mouth in a death grin. The T-Rex's smile is described as a death grin. Further solidifying, solidifying the author's strong comparison of the beast to murder, to killing. Also sentence forms. I did say we have utilizing many comma separated lists. We also have a ton of sculptured stone. It closed its mouth in a death grin. It ran. Its pelvic bones crushing aside trees and bushes. Its talon feet clawing damp earth, leaving... All right, so we have a lot of long sentences that just keep going, but I don't know what that's called. What's the other thing at once? Language features and techniques. Oh, maybe there's an alliteration in here. I know that one. Uh, lifted easily upon the sky, its mouth gaped, exposing offensive teeth like daggers. Ah, uh, so there's nothing in here I don't think that has an alliteration, so I can't just throw that in there. I said personification. Sentence forms, I've used the comma separated lists, words and phrases. Yeah, you know what? I think we're good. How many more? Yeah, see? I think we've done all right, all right? I'm interested to read the rest of the story because now you have to think about the whole of the source. 20 minutes in. I think that's good. I am going to be trying to do this as fast as possible, which I wouldn't recommend if you're actually taking this test. It ran with a gliding ballet step. Interesting. Didn't know it could dance. Far too poised and balanced for its 10 tons. It moved into the sunlit area warily. Oh, adverb. It's beautifully reptilian hands feeling the air. Why? Why? Eccles twitched his mouth. It could reach up and grab the moon. That is an embellishment? Yeah. Embellishment, is that what it's called? It's, it's so uh, ridiculous, it's not possible. I hope it's embellishment, I hope that's the word. Uh, well, anyway, shh. Travis jerked angrily, he hasn't seen us yet. It can't be killed, Eccles pronounced this verdict quietly, as if there, was, there could be no argument. He had weighed the evidence and this was his considered opinion. The rifle in his hands seemed like a toy gun. We were fools to come, this is impossible. Shut up, hissed Travis. Nightmare. Turn around, commanded Travis. Walk quietly to the machine. We'll remit half your fee. I didn't realize it would be this big, said Eccles. I miscalculated, that's all. And now I want out. It sees us. There's the red paint on its chest. Oh, blood. The tyrant lizard raised itself. Its armored flesh glittered like a thousand green coins. The coins, crusted with slime, steamed. In the slime, tiny insects wriggled so that the entire body seemed to twitch and undulate. Ooh even while the monster itself did not move. It exhaled. The stink of raw flesh blew down in the wilderness. Get me out of here, said Eccles. It was never like this before. I was always sure I'd come through alive. I had good guides, good safaris, and safety. This time, I figured wrong. I've met my match and admit it. This is too much for me to get a hold of. Boy, this guy's going crazy now. Don't run, said Lesperance. Turn around. Hide in the machine. Yes, Eccles seemed to be numb. He looked at his feet as if trying to make them move. He gave a grunt of helplessness. Eccles! He took a few steps, blinking, shuffling. Not that way. The monster, at the first motion, lunged forward with a terrible scream. It covered 100 yards in six seconds. The rifles jerked up and blazed fire. A windstorm from the beast's mouth engulfed them in the stench of slime and old blood. The monster roared, teeth glittering with sun. The rifles cracked again, but the sound was lost to the shriek and lizard thunder. <laughs> Lizard Thunder. It's a good band name. Uh, the great level of the reptile's tail swung up, lashed sideways. Trees exploded in clouds of leaf and branch. The monster twitched its jewel's ha jeweler's hands down to fondle at the men, to twist them in half, to crush them like berries, to cram them into its teeth and its screaming throat. Its boulder stone eyes leveled with the men. They saw themselves mirrored. They fired at the metallic eyelids and the blazing black iris, like a stone idol, like a mountain avalanche. Tyrannosaurus. Fell. Wow, what a journey. I thought they were going to get owned there. End of source! All right. So you now need to think about the whole of the source. This text is from the middle of a short story. How has the writer structured the text to interest you as a reader? I felt interested the whole time, actually. What if the structural features don't interest me at all? I just enjoyed reading. You ever think about that, GCSE? What the writer focuses our attention on in the beginning. Let's find out what, what he actually does there. In the very beginning, we've got very big descriptors for the jungle. Eccles seems excited. He's shaking like a kid. Right. We've got a lot of sounds going on. He's de describing the sounds multiple times, full of twitterings, murmurs. And then everything just stopped. So, I th so it sets the mood. Everything's kind of alive. And then, bam, everything's silent. It's dead. Sound of thunder. So then... It, it almost like sets the mood and then shuts it down. Is that a literary technique? I don't know. <laughs> so if we're looking at the actual prompt, it wants to know, so what it focuses, I know how to answer this. 
what the, the writer focuses on in the beginning, how and why he changes this focus as the source develops, and any other structural features that interest me. How do you guys do this? I just, I just really didn't like English. I love math. I can tell you about the number of commas. A lot. It's a big number. <clears throat> Our guy here, Eccles, he's shaking like a kid. And this is it. So he's haunted a lot of things. He's very excited. However, once it gets silent there, it's then described in detail as terrifying, like murder. So we're kind of like seeing it through the eyes of Eccles, our main character, our protagonist here. Oh, I use that word, just protagonist. Points? Do you, I'm just trying to get points for anything. Why? Why? All right, so it could reach up and grab the moon. So when he uses this embellishment, I really hope that's the word, you can tell that he's, he's like gone from that excitement now to he's terrified. It can't be killed. Yeah, so he's now switched. He switched completely here. This is impossible. Yeah, he's given up hope. He went from excitement, seeing it and described, and then terror. Oh, then he builds up a bit of panic. Now he's like, get me out, get me out, get me out. I need to get out of here to really like drive home that, gosh, he's really terrified. He doesn't want to be involved in this at all. And then there's the fight scene basically. So we've got that. And then everything is over. It's, it's done. What the writer focuses your attention on at the beginning of the source? Pray for me. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And then he, <laughs> At the beginning of the source, the writer uses many adjectives. So he uses literary techniques? Which ones, you might ask? <laughs> if I know. He uses uh, literary techniques to create an atmosphere of excitement and peace. He describes the setting as having sounds like music to go along with the protagonist's excitement for the hunt. Do you guys like this? Do y'all English majors will enjoy this? I de by destroy I like reading, but this, by describing Eccles, oh God, does his name have a, why would they give me Eccles? Listen, there's one Eccle, I'm doing apostrophe S. By describing Eccles is, oh, by describing Eccles, let's do that, as shaking like a kid, we feel his childlike excitement. Uh, how and why the writer changes this focus. Here we go, watch this. Ever hyphen, growing, mm -hmm, ever growing with a hyphen. Practitioner's gonna love that. Practitioner? What, greater, marker? Uh, then the writer uses silence as a split in the source between our protagonist's excitement and his ever-growing fear of the beat. So he does do all that and he does that to contrast. He begins with such peaceful descriptors to deeply contrast. Yeah. So I don't hate this. I just don't enjoy it. How and why the writer changes this focus. So he does it because we're supposed to be with Eccles, you know, we're supposed to be feeling his fear. We're supposed, he like, he did a good job. <laughs> Can I just say like, writer did good. No, writer did well. So uh, the writer allows the protagonist to tell us he's shaking like a kid. So later on in the source, when he's describing the T-Rex, he can y utilize, what am I doing? Describing the T-Rex, he can utilize descriptors relating. Oh my God, my foot. Sitting on your leg for that long, it's not good. It's not good for your leg. I now have to sit really, really weird. You shouldn't be using a lot of your time when you're taking this test to choose how you're sitting. All right, just wanna say. This is the structural feature that interests me, all right? The writer allows the protagonist to tell us that he's shaking as light, like a kid. So later on in the source, when he's describing the T-Rex, he can utilize descriptors relating Further American Echo feels to, it's like he said a toy soldier. He'll examine men like toys. Oh, and he says toy gun. When the writer says the beast would examine men like toys, or you put a comma there, when Eccles refers to his gun as a toy gun. This technique really helps ground the reader in the feeling that like he is out of his depth. The embellishment, I'm praying for that, that the beast could, and we'll put another quote in there, grab the moon, also helps to paint a picture of an overwhelmingly intimidating foe Ow! Okay, I need probably one more like structural feature about this that I enjoyed. Like a stone idol, like a mountain avalanche. I enjoy that he does that. It says what other, I'm interested in the structural features of that. I just don't know what they're called really. The rifles, like commas, lists. I really enjoy his use of lists. Trees exploded into clouds. Like, come on, those, those are great, great verbs. 
Verbs. I, what's, is it a gerund when a verb is used as an adjective, like blazing? I, I can't remember. Participial phrase? Arr. Don't run, turn around, hide in the machine. Quick short sentences. Oh, I do like that. By writing the dialogue in short sentences, the writer continues to build uh, tension as it contrasts greatly with the long comma separated sentences that describe the T-Rex. I think that's it, y'all. I think uh, I think that's all I can write. We've got 42 minutes on the clock, still recording on both cameras as opposed to last time when I had to stop recording for a bit. All right, extra space, nope. Oh my God, there's another one? Oh no, <laughs> what was I thinking? Focus on this part. How much time should I have spent on the first, on this entire thing? No, I have no idea what's, I'm wasting time, but I wanna know how much time. 45 minutes. You were advised to spend about 45 minutes. All right, suppose I got three minutes to do this bit. I really thought I was making really good time. <laughs> Focus this part of your answer on the second part of the source from line 31 to end. All right, all right. So basically this entire page. Oh man, this is stressful. They, you're already doing a hard thing and they're gonna time me like this. A student said, this part of the story where the men encounter the Tyrannosaurus Rex shows Eccles is right to panic. The monster is terrifying. To what extent do you agree? In your response, you could consider your own impressions of his reaction, evaluate how the writer describes the monster and support your response. Didn't I, I feel like I did that. Can I just be like, see my previous descriptions? I, I was saying he, look, look, he was comparing to an evil god Feeling of intimidation to the reader. Uh, you know, on, am I gonna rewrite my whole answer basically? I feel like this is a pretty similar. Oh, but I guess this is one of those where they, they want you to like debate 20 marks. They wanna show that you know both sides of the story. So consider your own impressions, evaluate how the writer describes the monster, support your response with references to the text, so, of course. This part of the story when the men encounter the Tyrannosaurus Rex shows Eccles' is right to panic. Uh, to what extent do you agree? Well, the writer gives many great descriptions of the beast that would lead one to agree with the student. The, he compares the guns they have to toy guns, making them feel useless against such a mighty foe, comma, and describes the beast as covered in slime, which is pretty disgusting. I can't just say which is disgusting, which is gross. Covered in slime and stinking of raw flesh, which at the aforementioned size would terrify even the bravest of men. So now I need to describe a way in which I kind of disagree and then overall give my opinion. We've, we've kind of had these in the States as well. The States, what I'm gonna do is say, however, Travis seems so incredibly calm and disappointed with Eccles. Eccles is a weird name. Eccles's, uh-oh, Eccles's reaction that one might disagree with the students. Frick, my hand really hurts. How do you do this? Ah, the beast may appear scary, but with Travis's calm demeanor, we also get the impression that this is not quite out of the ordinary for him, and we should feel safe. Okay, I've gone over six minutes. I think I've got one more sentence left, which is like, in my opinion, the T-Rex is so terrifying that even with Travis's remarks, I feel Eccles had every right to panic. All right, done. Is that, is that it? We're, we're a bit over. <sighs> the dreaded picture prompt. I hate picture prompts. I'll just throw the, I just don't like writing. How do they do it in the UK? How is the GCSE done? Section B, writing. You're advised to spend 45 minutes on this section. I'm gonna spend less, we'll see. You're reminded of the need to plan your answer. Oh God, really? Oh, my leggies. <sighs> Sit down in class. Sorry, miss. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Oh, don't want to bump that. The whole camera will come down. So your local newspaper is running a creative writing competition. Why? And the best entries will be published. They ain't picking mine. Write a story about time travel as suggested by this picture. Or describe your life as you imagine it in 200 years time. I'm dead. Oh, describe life. <laughs> okay, that would've been easy. It's cold, I'm dead. So I'm gonna use the picture prompt. I find that there's a lot to work with here and I have no writing ability to just come up with stuff out of thin air. So I wanna plan my story. It's about time travel and we have this picture. So I'm gonna try and get as many adjectives and or 
things that I'm seeing in this picture as possible to, to build my story. I really want to focus on the lights. This is Grand Central Station, Grand Central Terminal. This is in New York City, if you guys didn't know. I'm an American, so I've got this hidden information to give the invigilator an extra point for myself. This looks like it could be in the 50s, so I'm gonna say uh, 50s. I have no idea what I'm doing, y'all. All right, let's, let's try our best. I wanna plan it out, so maybe I should come up with one of those cyclical techniques where you start this, the story with the same sentence as the ended on. I use that for my college acceptance essay. I got accepted. So it's about time travel. I think I'm going to be late. Now I've watched Dark on Netflix too many times to count and so I feel like I got a lot of time travel knowledge. I think I'm gonna try and make a story in which I travel back in time <laughs> to find my grandpa to get him to miss a train so that he doesn't fall in love with my grandma, and then thus I kill myself, I am dead. That is the story, I'm gonna try and build this in, I'm gonna try and do it in under 20 minutes, all right? Watch the master at work, I'm going to be late. That's all I got! <laughs> I was really confident going into this. I, what I wanna do is describe like a couple sentences and then get to the stuff in the picture so that way it's not just like being force fed this. So. I'm going to be late. As the swirling cloud of smoke emitted from the tiny gold contraption fully consumes me, I awake. I don't feel too different, I thought aloud as I quickly remember my task. I'm trying to describe the train. The sound of a whirring, I'm so bad at writing. The sound of a whirring constant murmur fills my ears as I rush around a corner from my hidden entry point and enter Grand Central Station. He could be anyone I disparage as I jolt to and fro the station, trying to catch a glimpse of my target. Now, I'm gonna use an alliteration so that they know what I'm up to. The, oh, what if I use crowd? The carnivorous? Oh yeah, that's a good word to describe a crowd because they're in they're eating like all the, the, the other people in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? Like I can't see them because they're, it's a, it's a literary technique. The, so I need another C word, the crazed, Carnivorous crowd. That's it. I want to say carnivorous because I want to describe them as like That's the feeling, you know, the crazed carnivorous crowd ebbed and flowed through the station with near lookalikes to my target quickly consumed by their ever changing ever changing by their Oh superfluous by their river flowing. Oh in the myriad. Oh, that's a word myriad of beams flooding the terminal I really got to work on this my eyes skittered left to right, yet they all moved too quickly. All was lost. I wanna, I haven't even talked about the fact that it is olden times. My assignment, impossible. Oh, I'm gonna change the story so now I don't know that my boss has told me to basically kill myself. Like, my, it's my boss's fault. My assignment, impossible. I wish they'd sent me to the future for once. Everyone in the 40s dresses the same. So I've built up enough, I think I've described this picture with the beams and the people and the terminal. So now I'm gonna just quickly bring the story to a close. I'm doing this one real fast. All right, we don't have much memory on this card. I had two hours, a 4K, 422, 10 bit, you know, we try my best. I don't think I'll ever find him. And now I'm gonna use a simile type thing. Like a hawk, spotting its next meal, I saw him. Standing alone, let me see that picture again. Near the train timetables, I saw my victim furtively studying the sign. I exploded into a sprint as if my life depended on it. The man turned to make his way towards platform three, but I was too quick. Boom! I want to use octogenarian. No, he's a young, he's a, he's a grandpa in the future, but I collided with the young looking businessman causing his suitcase to unleash Upon the station, a cloud of papers like a plague. Watch where you're going. Oh, I really gotta bring this home. Bring this home. My hands hurt so much. Oh, just my right. Oh, I want another alliteration maybe, or some type of, I'm not good at writing. I just know alliterations, you know? I could personify. No, we, we don't want like replied. Sorry, I, sorry. I offered. I'm really trying my best, guys. I hope you know. I'm not a writer here. Sorry, I, offer I offered as I looked back at my objective list. I wonder what makes this guy so important. 
So originally I think, I, I was thinking maybe of having like a woman on the train look at him and be like, that man hot, I was gonna have his babies. However, I now realize that that's telling too much of the story in the end and not in the beginning. But I kind of wanted it to be a mystery. You don't really know what's going on. I'm gonna give myself 13 more minutes. I really just wanna finish this story. They've given me a lot of space to write like, wow, the biggest story in the world here. But I've got this. I'm gonna do it an hour and a half, all right? I think that's the amount of time allotted as I watch him helplessly run for the departing train. Oh, I'm gonna make this so cheesy, but I really just wanna drive it. I really just wanna finish this. Ooh, can I put something back in the beginning about the la the name of the person? Nah, I'm, this is gonna be a bad story. As I reread my task again, ensuring no mistakes, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, Bauman, the man's last name, was the was the name my grandfather had used. Should I use like some type of traditional Yiddish name? Bauman, the man's last name, was the name my grandfather had used before. I should have used a woman, so that way I could have just said like, oh, that was the maiden name. <sighs> Bauman, the man's last name, was the name my grandfather had used before moving to Canada. No, I cried out as I rushed to stop the connecting train. But each step I took got lighter and lighter as I gazed in horror at the back of my hands, which slowly faded to dust. Mr. Bauman never caught that train, nor did he ever meet my grandmother in Quebec. My dying thoughts turned to vengeance. I didn't do this on purpose, but now I'm become dust and we were talking about that in the beginning. So as the glittering dust that is now my being disseminates through the terminal, adding itself unsuspiciously to the sunbeams. I'm trying my best here. Dejected, Mr. Bauman looks at his watch. I'm going to be late. Bam! All right, I think that's it. I think we've, we've finished an English GCSE. We now have to look at the mark scheme to figure out what is going on. But I think without further ado, we've done it. Oh, there's a Ray Bradbury? No. Oh. I like Ray Bradbury. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. These are all out of order. My terrible, terrible story. Would you buy this story? What do you rate this in terms of like YouTuber book? <laughs> and now that I'm done with the test, let's see how I did. Hey, have you told them about the video sponsor yet? Uh, no. Why? Well, I, I just assume they already knew. Oh, so you're telling me they already know that NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there, which is really useful when you're using Wi-Fi while traveling or at a cafe? I mean, I don't know how useful the traveling bit is at the moment. Okay, sure, but do they know that they can also, just with a click of a button, change their browsing location to watch some region locked TV shows? Yeah, I'm fairly certain they also know that already. Well, as long as they also know that you can get 68% off of a two year plan by going to nordvpn.com slash Evan or using code Evan at checkout, then I guess, yeah, they must know about this spawn already. Yeah, they know. Oh, it does already sound like they know about NordVPN. Well, good luck writing your exam. Thanks. It's called marking here, by the way. So when I pass the British exam, the English language GCSE, uh, let's find out, got the mark scheme. I give one point for each point about this jungle. Responses must be true and drawn only from lines one to nine. Students may quote or paraphrase. A paraphrase response covering more than one point should be credited for each point made. The jungle was tall. There are a lot of different sounds in the jungle. The jungle was very vast, broad. Uh, the jungle was misty, all right? I think all those should count. There were pterodactyls also except reference to birds. What, have I gotten nothing? List four things about this jungle from part of the source. There are dinosaurs. What? The jungle was full of peaceful natural noises. Ah, yes. There were a lot of different sounds in the jungle. I didn't say peaceful. I'm gonna give myself one point, all right? I'm a good invigilator. Yeah, I've got that, all right? There were tall trees. That counts, all right? The jungle was very vast. I don't think I'm gonna get a point for that, am I? I guess I was supposed to write things like there were dinosaurs. God damn it, really? Well, it looks like I've got two points out of the necessary four. That's embarrassing. I think this one's supposed to be the easy one. The jungle was vast, Evan. I think the jungle was misty, deserves a point personally, but I don't see anything. Oh, it was misty in the jungle. You know what, I'm, I, that's three. Okay, it was misty in the jungle is on there. However, being very vast, I, I don't think that really is going to count. There's no implicit information. So I got three. Next up, uh, it says, shows perceptive and detailed understanding of language. Ugh. Analyzes the effects of the writer's choices of language. 
I feel like I'm not gonna get many marks on this. The writer employs an, an extended metaphor of power and strength to describe the T-Rex. He says it towered over the trees, the verb towered suggesting that the huge creature is imposing itself on its jungle surroundings from a great height and intimidating everything beneath it. Who speaks like this? I said, the writer describes the T-Rex as overwhelmingly tall by saying it towered 30 feet above the trees, and by comparing it to an evil god, he's creating a feeling of intimidation for the reader. I think that's pretty good. However, it personifies- Oh! As great evil god, implying the T-Rex is an all-powerful being without mercy, and also a terrible warrior, an image that conveys the idea of an invincible fighting machine destroying everything in its wake. I do not think I'm gonna get the 7 to 8 on that. Let's look at five to six. Uh, the writer says the T-Rex Tower of the Jungle. The verb towered suggests yes. So that's basically what I've written. I haven't done all the other descriptors here. The creature is described metaphorically as a great evil god, suggests its massive size and wicked nature. Yeah, that, that seems like I've written that. And the uh, terrible warrior implies the T-Rex is a fighter to be feared, prepared to use its strength. Uh, he compares the teeth to daggers, shows a comparison to weapons. I mean, yeah, I I'm gonna give myself, I wrote a lot for this, okay? Utilizing many comma-separated lists, he builds a terrifying image of the beast which, with increasing intensity. Come on, this is definitely in the level three understanding. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna give myself for this one uh, five to six marks. We're in the level three. I'm definitely not in level four. This person, whoever wrote that, who is this? Billy Shakespeare? I touched on each of these points though, so I think personally, and also professionally, I think this is more of a six out of eight. I've definitely not achieved the perceptive detailed analysis, but that's okay. The reader together with the characters has traveled back in time. Initially, the jungle, jungle appears natural and undisturbed, but this all changes with the words suddenly, which almost creates a moment frozen in time for the reader. Who? This person deserves a seven out of eight, whoever wrote that, God. Uh, it is followed by a silence and then a sound of thunder. So I have, at the beginning of the source, the writer uses many literary techniques to create an atmosphere of excitement. Except I said atmosphere. Let's give myself an X. Atmosphere of excitement and peace. He describes the setting as having sounds like music to go along with the protagonist's excitement of the hunt. By describing Eccles as shaking like a kid, we feel his childlike excitement for what he expects to come. Yeah, but I haven't described the suddenly or any of this. I said, then the writer uses silence as a split between the, the excitement and the ever-growing fear of the beast. Yet again, I just don't think I'm anywhere near that seven to eight marks, I, if I'm being very honest with myself. Also, by the way, if you're watching this, tell me if I'm being too harsh or too kind to myself. I'm, I'm assuming you already will be doing this. Uh, at first, the jungle seems calm and the noises are natural. Then it changes to a sudden silence followed by the sound of thunder. The next line out of the mist, 100 yards away, came the T-Rex, is when the reader grasps that the cause of this noise is the terrifying monster. The rest of the text consists of description, which suggests it's becoming fiercer, and the dialogue between the two men shows Eccles increasing panic. Now that sounds a bit more like, honestly, I feel like I'm like in between now, like six or seven. Uh, by writing the dialogue in short sentences, the writer continues to build tension as it contrasts greatly with the long comma separated sentences that describe the T-Rex. I think, I think that's good, all right? And I think I'm in the seven. I'm definitely not eight. I'm not at that range, but I'm giving myself seven for that, okay? I, I think that's a, that's a good seven. Echo's reactions change throughout the source. At first, he seems quite calm, merely resigned to the fact that he's shooting it it is an impossible task, but then when he says it can't be killed, he's offering his considered opinion, having weighed the evidence, and a panicked man wouldn't be capable of rational thought. What? What? <laughs> he uh, feels unprepared and his rifle compared to a toy gun uh, suggests a, it's a plaything you would use in a make-believe game rather than an effective weapon against a tyrant lizard with armored flesh. I, I've said this, I said it in the previous one, I've said it here somewhere. I really didn't write much for this answer though, yikes. Yeah, I said he compares the guns to toy guns, making them useless against such a mighty foe. And he describes the beast as covered in slime and stinking of raw flesh, which the aforementioned size of the thing could terrify even the bravest of men. Yeah, it's a bit weak, isn't it? I've done a weak job on that. We empathize with the reaction because the writer's multi-sensory description, which graphically conveys the revolting T-Rex is, we see its skin is crusted in slime, implying the oozing pus is congealed into dry scabs, which when inhales, we smell the stink of raw flesh blew into the wilderness, suggesting it carries with it a death, death and destruction. Ugh. Eventually, Eccles seems numb, conveying that by now he's paralyzed by fear and the rational thought he displayed at the beginning has completely vanished. There is a 0% chance I'm in this. I should just skipped, just give up on the 16 to 20 points. However, do I have clear relevant evaluation? His rifles compared to a toy gun, how small and inadequate it is. Yep, I said making it useless against such a mighty foe. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think his reaction is panic at this stage because it says he pronounced this verdict quietly. But when the creature sees the men, he then starts to fear for his life. I didn't talk about that at all. The, the, both the first and the second level here both talked about how he then begins to fear for his life. Not only can we see that, yes, I understand that. I, uh, I don't know why. I, I don't know why I expected to do well on this. Eccles says it can't be killed when he first sees the T-Rex because it is so big. That's basically what I've written. I don't agree that he's panic at this point, but he compares his rifle to a toy gun to show how useless it is, and so he must be scared. I didn't obviously do the prompt the right way. I was thinking you're supposed to like consider the opinion and then consider the opposite and then state what I actually think. The T-Rex is so terrifying that even Travis's remarks, I feel Eccles had every right to panic. But it asked me to what extent do I agree? I think I've done a good job at answering that question. I don't know where all these things are coming from. Who's expecting to do this? The Tyrannosaurus Rex is really big, and I think Eccles is scared. His rifle is like a toy gun, so it's no good to shoot at such a huge monster. When the monster sees the men, Eccles panics and wants to leave. The writer says, crust him with slime, which sounds horrible, so I don't blame him for one. <laughs> that sounds like mine. <laughs> oh no. Oh, there's so many points on this one. Oh, it literally was like, he's covered in slime. That sounds pretty gross, man. <laughs> I used the word demeanor. Can I get a point for this? I want to give myself six out of 20. Oh God. I think I'm definitely not anywhere near the first two ranks here, but oh, I'm really embarrassed. This is rough. This is rough. I did, a, I did well on a German GCSE. I, I passed that with flying colors, but I think it's because this is like, what is this? A creative writing and understand. Oh boy. I could not do this in German in the slightest. Oh my God. I'm going to give myself seven points out of 20. I don't know where the end of this is. So I'm going to put seven over 20. Yikes. So far, we've got three out of four, then we have six out of eight, seven out of eight. Really, I did that well? Yeah. However, I then completely bombed this section and got six out of 20. So these are my scores so far. This is looking really hopeless. Hope you all do better than me. Uh, hopefully you're learning from my mistakes. These credits should be given according to the quality of what's written. So the progressive reaction of Eccles from calm to fear inducing paralysis. I kind of talked about that. The comparison of the rifle to a toy gun to emphasize inadequacy. I did do that. The sensory description of the T-Rex. I kind of did that. Whether or not the T-Rex is terrifying. I feel like maybe I could have gotten eight points, but I'm going to stick with the small points because I'm trying to be real about how an invigilator would really feel about me. All right. So I'm going to try and grade the story myself based on what we have here in the mark scheme. And then I'm going to ask my flatmates to see what their opinion is and see if I deserved a higher or lower grade based on what I got. So at level four, we're going to read it just for the jokes. I don't think I'm anywhere near level four for this. I just don't. All right. I'm just going to go out there. We have communication is convincing and compelling. Tone, style, and register are assuredly matched to purpose and audience. Extensive an ambitious vocabulary with sustained crafting. Listen, I used glittered. That's a big word. Grumbled. Throwing stuff out there. I also threw in a myriad. Right? That's a good word. Writing is compelled. Compelling. Incorporating a range of convincing and complex ideas. Just skip. I just gotta skip. Well, there's no way. What do we got lower level for? Communication is convincing. Tone, style, and register are convincingly matched to purpose of the audience. Sure. Extensive vocabulary with conscious crafting of linguistic devices. I used an alliteration. I get points for that. And consistently coherent use of paragraphs. Yes, you see this indentions, the, in the indenting. We know how to make a paragraph. I, I get this, right? Can I just put myself in 19 to 21? Communication is clear. Tone is matched to purpose and audience. A sophisticated vocabulary and phrasing chosen with effect. I'm hoping I'm gonna be in this area and not in this area. Communicates with some success. Ooh, communicates with some sustained success. I think my my communication's pretty clear. The tone, style, and register are generally matched to purpose for the audience and vocabulary clearly chosen for the effect. That sounds about it, lower three. The higher three, increasingly sophisticated vocabulary. Increasingly? Do you want me to start off being like, see spot run and be like, spot ran sprintingly fast, making up my own words? This is some, this is some bull crap. Watch where you're going, now that. It's a good sentence. We used some dialogues. I, I threw commas in. I know how to write dialogue. Dejected comma. That's right. Mr. Bauman looks at his watch. I'm gonna be late. Listen, that's a cool device. The cyclical type storytelling. Dust glittered delicately. Oh, you know what? That's not an alliteration, but I like the D and the D there. I like, well, I think we're doing an all right job. I wish they'd sent me 
to uh, the future for once I grumbled everyone. Uh, you know what? Everyone in the 40s. Okay, we've done the 40s. I just don't think I'll ever find him. Then, like a hawk spotting its me next meal, I saw him. This is coherent. Everything flows. I'm gonna be real. I don't think I deserve to be in the level two. I don't, I'm not near your level four. Those, those people are wild. But I think I'm in level three. I'm in between top or bottom, up or lower. So basically, I'm either a 17 or a 14. And I'm gonna ask my flatmates to see if they think I should be in the 17 or the 14 or lower or higher. Let's see. This is Noah, my flatmate. His shirt is skin colored. <laughs> <laughs> this is the prompt, all right? The local newspapers are in creative writing competition. The best entries will be published. Either write a story about time travel suggested by this picture. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be late. What? Oh, I wrote that. I was just kind of planning some stuff. Oh. You know, me planning. <laughs> Your planning is I'm going to be late <laughs> at the 50s. <laughs> from the, I can't read it right now. From the ting. From the ting? Oh my god, I'm going to fail already. As the swirling cloud of smoke, smoke emitted, emitted from, from the, the ting. I'm gonna be honest, it looks like I said ting. What is it? Oh, tiny, tiny, tiny. contraption, cloud, cloud of... I'm gonna read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I obviously have chicken scratch handwriting. I awake. I don't feel too different, I thought aloud, as I quickly remembered my task. The sound of a whirring constant murmur filled my ears as I rush around a corner from my hidden entry point and enter Grand Central Station. He could be anyone, I disparage, as I jolt to and fro the station, trying to catch a glimpse of my target. The crazed, carnivorous crowd ebbed and flowed ah, throughout the station, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. with near lookalikes to my target, quickly consumed by their ever-changing and ever-moving forms. Dust glittered delicately in the myriad of beams of sun, flooding the terminal in its warm glow. My eyes skittered left to right, yet they all moved too quickly. All was lost, my assignment impossible. I wish they'd sent me to a to the future for once, I grumbled. Everyone in the 40s dresses the same. I just don't think I'll ever find him. Then, like a hawk, spotting its next meal, I saw him, standing alone near the train times tables. I saw my victim, furtively studying the sign, hadn't a second to waste. At that moment, I exploded into a sprint as if my life depended on it. The man turned to make his way towards platform three, but I was too quick. Boom! <laughs> I collided with the young-looking businessman, causing his suitcase to unleash upon the station a cloud of papers like a plague. Watch where you're going, he cried out angrily, desperately trying to collect his belongings. Sorry. I offered as I looked back at my objective list. Hmm, I wonder what makes this guy so important that I have to bump into him here, I ponder as I watch him helplessly run for the departing train. As I reread my task again, ensuring no mistakes, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Mr. Bauman, the man, Bauman, the man's last name, was the name of my grandfather that he had used before moving to Canada. No, no, I cried out as I rushed to stop the connecting train, but each step I took got lighter and lighter as I gazed in horror at the back of my hands, which slowly faded to dust. Mr. Bauman never caught that train, nor did he ever meet my grandmother in Quebec. My dying thoughts turned to vengeance as the glittering dust that is now my being disseminates through the terminal, adding itself unsuspiciously to the sunbeams. Dejected, Mr. Bauman looks at his watch. I'm going to be late. Yeah, it starts and finishes the same. Wait, that was a literary technique. Meet your grandmother, because you got the wrong train. Yeah, so he never meets her, and therefore Didn't I never get born. Train? That yeah, I was implied. Okay, good. I thought so because I was like, you could just get. The Originally, train. I was gonna have it be like a woman looking off, being like, "What a hot man!" But oh. I, I, I don't think I could do that. That's good. So you, you, it's very you're very much putting in like alliteration. Yeah. Similes, <laughs> metaphors, like they're just. Definitely that. But do you feel like they fit or did I just kind of throw them in? I mean, I think both. I think both, yeah. I, I think some of them I'm like, hell yeah. Some of them I'm like, I know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I figured that the, they were just going to give me points based on how many of those I just sh shoved in. 40 marks, 24 for content and organization, 16 for technical accuracy. Oh. That's rubbish. So in terms of no, my... yours is good, but that's just not how writing good... I, yeah. I tried my best to throw in a lot of things that would make the story interesting. I finished the story. In terms of my content and organization, I gave myself an a upper to lower three. I just gave up on four. Four says that I had varied and intensive use of structural features. Writing is compelling, incorporating a range of convincing and complex ideas, and I fluently link paragraphs. Why did you not give yourself a four? You really, well, I was, I was trying to be, do you really think that was a four? Oh yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I was I was I was more paying attention to like every like like simile or like meta or like those kind of things you put in that like I wasn't looking at the different paragraphs. It was like low four. 
Low four. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I haven't. I don't know if this even was how my GCSEs were marked. I don't remember. Well, that's how this one was in 2018. Also, I get 16 points for technical accuracy, and yeah, I believe. You got that. Uh, I mean, I used a full range of appropriate sentences. I used standard English. I don't think I spelled anything wrong. I, I had one actual misspelling. I, instead of saying atmosphere, I put atmosphere. But that was just... Yeah, but that's clearly not like you don't know how to spell it. Yeah, that was just... Yeah, no, but I still think that's... That's the only spelling mistake that I think that I made. So I was going to give myself a, a lower three for the technical accuracy. Lower three out of four? I'm sorry, lower four. Yeah, yeah the technical, so I think I'll give myself a 13. I can't believe, so you're saying I, I'd probably be around a four. A lower four, I'm gonna give myself a 19. Wait, if you're, com you're comparing yourself against 16 year olds. I know, but I've looked at the example story. The 16 year olds that were writing this level four, where it's like, the beginning of the text focuses our attention on Eccles and his guide, Travis, in a prehistoric jungle setting. The reader, together with the characters, has traveled back in time. Initially, the jungle appears natural and undisturbed, but this changes all of a sudden with this word yeah. suddenly. Like, uh, that, that I can tell that that's like kids will have been told to write it like that like at the yes. beginning the reader knows this Who's gonna say culminating in his realization that he is out of his depth? I went I'm out of my depth and I went down to three <laughs> This was not an enjoyable experience for me. I really liked doing the math, but I did not enjoy doing this Honestly, I'm gonna give myself a lower four for the technical accuracy, but a h upper three for the content I didn't plan yeah. it, but I've got enough going on there. So I'm gonna give myself a 13 out of 16 for the technical, and out of the 24, 13 to 18 marks, I'm gonna give myself 17, which means that is 30. My total score is nine, 16, 22, 52. How many marks were available? 80. Oh, okay. 52 out of 80. Shoot. What is that? 65%. Is that good? Is that... Oh, God. I Honestly, I didn't study English in school. Makes me feel real dumb though. Thank you, England. Well, I did about as well as I thought I would. In terms of comparing this to how the tests are in the US, it really isn't much of a difference between an actual English exam in your English class for like 10th grade, 11th grade English. However, we don't, our, our tests are standardized. Our SAT is just a multiple choice thing. There is the writing segment, which is comparable. There is a picture prompt, but no one really counts it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, no college actually cares about the writing segment. So this can be comparable to just taking your honors English class and, you know, trying your best in English. Was I good in English? No, math is my better subject. Abba, I really enjoy other languages, so maybe maybe that's the mathy part of me. I don't actually know. But uh, if you took the GCSE, tell me how you did. Please tell me you did worse than me, or maybe you're a genius. Does any of you actually get upper level four? Do, do you find out? Do they tell you how you did? Like, do you get to see your reports? Because in the US, you get to see all of your tests back. You know how you did. In the UK, it seems that you just kind of get this mystery letter or number these days. I don't actually know. But anyway, uh, thank you for watching this video. It's the sign off time. If you enjoyed it, it's a long one. Please be sure to give it a big old thumbs up. Subscribe, <laughs> because subscribing is very important to my channel. Without it, I will die. Anyway, I will see you guys on the next one. Goodbye.